So here's all the, all the necessary basic information that everybody should know about, uh, about the moon. I'm not going to read it. The only thing that I found interesting while I was doing the research is I didn't realize the moon actually has an atmosphere. It's not much of an atmosphere, but it actually does have an atmosphere. And like I said, you know, everybody in this room has a telescope. Every one of them can view the moon. You can use the view the moon. Now, some of us are refractor freaks. Some of us are Newtonian users. And some of us are catadioptric guys. I, I'll confess, I'm a refractor freak. There's a reason why I'm wearing a Stellar View shirt. <laughs> so, I confess. Um, refractor guys like, like refractors because the, it is the ultimate in contrast and sharpness. Uh, those, unfortunately, as you get, as they get bigger, it also becomes the ultimate in money. And they get expensive really fast. Uh, as far as eyepiece is concerned, it's just an area where, you know, looking at, viewing the moon, you don't really need the hyper-wide, super-wide field eyepieces. The, the classic uh, plossels, uh, amyorthoscopics uh, are fine. They're great because they're really high contrast. You can pick out a lot of details. And I used to have this kind of discussion a lot when I was, uh, when I was uh, uh, as a salesman because you're constantly working with people trying to figure out what they, what they expect to see and what they were really interested in. And people who tend to be who are more lunar and planetary they're probably better off with refractors and, uh, and, uh, and simpler eyepieces. Uh, people are deep sky, they, they need aperture, and we all know that. Apollo 11, mm -hmm. everybody remembers Apollo. How many here remember Apollo 11? I see enough gray hair to know that. <laughs> okay. Um, my my uh, research at uh, Apollo 11, uh, I found out some things that I did not realize. Uh, it's um, uh, Apollo 11. Uh, does anybody remember that during the landing sequence they had they kept on getting uh, error messages? Right. It was uh, 1201 and 1202 error messages, and what it was was the the, met, the computer on board was getting overloaded, and they were getting an overflow. What I didn't realize is, is the LEM computer <coughs> had memory of 2,048 bits. That's it. <laughs> Namely, our iPhones have just tons more <laughs> memory than that. And that poor uh, computer had uh, and it took them a while to figure out what was causing the overflow. And, uh, the, and, and this actually occurred in, in a couple of the other, uh, I think it was either 14 or 15 that actually occurred again. And they, they figured, by then they figured out what was happening. Uh, in landing, the, the LEM obviously had to use its landing radar. But just in case they had to abort, they had to keep the rendezvous radar on at the same time, but they didn't realize it was, it was passing data to the computer at the same time as the landing radar was. And so, data overflow. So here's, here's how you find uh, the landing site. It's in, in Sea of Tranquility. Um, it's, as I described that outreach, it's probably the easiest one to find because you basically look at three if you see it connected three circles, and you look at the middle one, and right at the bottom is roughly where it is. Uh, like I said, you will not see the lamb. You won't see, uh, but you get a general idea. In fact, if you have a big enough telescope, they, they've named three craters in that general area after the astronauts. There's a, uh, an Armstrong crater, there's an Aldrin crater, and there's a Collins crater. And fortunately, back in 2009, 
we have the, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter taking pictures, and they were actually able to capture the, you can see the, the, the landing uh, descent stage of Apollo 11. Now this, this picture, later on when you see some of the other, similar pictures of the other missions, it's a lot more interesting because you see footprints and all sorts of stuff like that. But here, they, they tried, just basically landed and just kind of gathered up stuff around the general vicinity because they didn't want to get too far away from the, from the land. Now, uh, as everybody, I assume everybody realizes that, that Neil Armstrong's actual words were uh, one step for a man, uh, one step for mankind, uh, the A got kind of glitched out, and the, there was a scientist who did a, a signal processing analysis, and he says the A is actually there. It just got lost in the transmission. Now, we all know that Neil Armstrong was the first man to step on the moon. The first man to pee on the moon was Buzz Aldrin. If you ever look at the films, you'll see him climbing down the, the, the ladder, and he seems to hesitate before he steps off. And, Neil, and, and Buzz Aldrin himself tells the story is, the reason was is that he was relieving himself. So, so blame my wife why it's not in the book, but at least I told you. It's one of the funny stories. Now, uh, the, they did have what they called the early Apollo uh, surface experiments package, which uh, there's part of it there. Um, this is the funniest story of all. U.S. Customs Forum, a declaration for moon rocks and moon dust. Yes, the Apollo 11 astronauts had to fill out that form and turn it in when they came into Honolulu. Uh, notice there's no value on there. But they did have to declare it. After this mission, they never did that to them again. They never did it to the, to the astronauts again. But this, this was funny. So, in November of 69, uh, we had we sent up our second uh, Apollo Apollo 12. Now, uh, read through the history of Apollo. What's interesting is NASA didn't have that much confidence in Apollo 11 actually landing. <coughs> they actually were assuming that these guys would be the first men on the moon because they didn't really know what they were getting themselves into in the, on Apollo 11. Uh, but anyway, as we know, 11 was successful. 12 uh, was really interesting. It's, uh, it's one of those cases where uh, when, they, when they launched, they got hit by lightning. Not once, but twice. And it knocked their power systems down. And if it weren't for the, for the quick reaction of, of two people, um, Alan Bean, the, the astronaut, who, oh, by the way, I met Alan Bean, he's a fascinating guy. And, um, and one of the ground controllers, they were able to switch to an alternate uh, uh, power bus and be able to bring the, uh, the spaceship back, the spacecraft back up to snuff and, uh, and continue on with the mission. So that, the, the, you know, and, and as I did my research through all the missions, I found that there was a good chance that every one of those missions could have failed. So this was the first of what they called their H missions. The, the first landing on the moon was called the G mission. The H missions, there were three H missions, and that's basically guys just walking around on the surface and picking up stuff. Now this one was, they really wanted to do a precision landing because there was a, the particular area they were going to in the ocean of storms was where the Surveyor 3 had landed years before. And Surveyor 3 had a funny history. It kind, of, it kind of hopped around on the surface and didn't really work the way they thought it would. And so the engineers really want to know what happened to this thing. And we'll talk about that a little later on. But uh, um, so the, and this was the first mission in which they actually put up the full-blown uh, Apollo lunar surface experiments package. This is 
uh, we'll just say L7. And, um, and they put in a geophysical station and uh, set up uh, seismometers. <laughs> Plays big part in the next mission. So, Ocean of Storms, it's just down from, from uh, Copernicus. Crater. And, like I said, here's, um, here's a little bit better picture from, uh, from uh, the LRO. And you can see uh, not only the descent stage, you can see where, where uh, Surveyor 3 is, and you can see footprints, footpaths, where they walked around. That's, and uh, the uh, orbiter was going around about 50 miles, 50 to 70 miles. And there's uh, uh, Pete Conrad standing next to the Surveyor 3. What they did find out is uh, from the, after they brought all the parts back and did an analysis, what they found out was the Vernier rockets on the Surveyor 3 never shut off when it landed. It was supposed to land when the Vernier rockets were supposed to shut off. It said it landed, bounced up, landed, bounced up, landed. So actually Surveyor 3 is the first man-made vehicle to launch from the surface. <laughs> Not quite planned, but that's the way it worked out. And the ALSEP, uh, and this is just part of the ALSEP. There's, it, it's scattered all around it. I don't want to jump up the briefing too much on that. So Apollo 13, gee, I don't think they landed. Yeah, they didn't, did they? Um, they were supposed to go to Fra Mauro. Uh, of course, we all know the, the problems they had. We all know that the movie gave the, the, the key line wrong. The movie presented it as uh, Houston, we have a problem. It was Houston, we had a problem. Uh, the movie also dramatized the guy, the astronauts arguing with each other. They never did that. There were some things that uh, Ron Howard, the director, did in order to make the movie interesting. And it was a great movie. It's probably one of my favorite movies of all time. And there's the damage uh, caused by the, <coughs> the oxygen tank exploding. The history of the oxygen tank is interesting because it was supposed to have gone up on Apollo 10. And during installation, they dropped it. And they had to refurbish it. So they put a different oxygen tank in, and it was rescheduled for 13. So they're putting it in the 13, they do the test, it fails. They pull it out, they refurbish again, stick it back in, it passes. And as we all know, it had some bare wires in it when they hit the stir, uh, the cryo stir, it sparked, bang! And, we had, we, and then we had Houston, we had a problem. Now here's the reason why I said that it was really good that Apollo 12 set up their uh, seismometers because even though uh, Apollo 13 did not land, its third stage did crash into the moon. And so they were able to get a reading from those seismometers from Apollo 12. So they did get some, some good uh, science out of that mission. Now, a funny story uh, came out of uh, Apollo 13. After they <coughs> landed, and safely, thank God. Uh, the Grumman engineers who designed the, the LEM thought it'd be humorous that they write up a towing bill and send it to North America. And they figured out, well, let's see now, uh, $8 for the first day, $4, uh, oh, $8 for the first mile, $4 for every additional mile, $8 a day for the additional passenger, came out to $310,000. So they sent it up the line as a joke. Uh, the guy who sent it up the line got fired. Two hours later, he got rehired by the CEO. The CEO said, I'm going to sign this. Sign it. They sent it to North America. North America replied by coming back saying, we haven't gotten paid for the ones we've delivered to the moon already. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was up to Apollo 14 to actually uh, do the Apollo 13 mission. So they are the ones who landed in Fra Mauro. 
This is the, the famous uh, um, uh, golf shot by uh, Alan Shepard. Where he's, if, if you're not familiar with the story, he stuck a barn, a specially modified six iron head that screwed onto the end of one of the, their uh, uh, tools. And so he unscrewed the tool and screwed the set on and did one arm uh, golf shots. So here's where Fra Morrow is. Oh, by the way, if you find Apollo 12's landing site, you will also be finding Apollo 14's landing site. They're actually not that far apart. And here's 14. Now this one was the, the last of the H missions. So the, and this was the only one where they had a little hand cart that they walked around with and put samples in. So the first J mission was uh, was 15. Uh, 15 was a very eventful uh, uh, mission. Um, uh, they went to the Hadley Rill uh, Apennine Mountains region. Uh, this is the first uh, first time that uh, that you they used the lunar rover. And so uh, you know. T uh, you can tell NASA's made up mostly of guys, right? What does a guy do? Take a car up onto the moon and drive it around. A convertible at that, right? <laughs> These are the only experiments left from Apollo that are still in working order. Why? Because they were totally passive. You fire a laser from the Earth, and it goes into the, the, the retro reflector, it comes back, you time it, you figure out how far the moon is from you. And it's using these devices, we figured out that the moon is moving away from us. Lunar rover. On this mission, they, uh, one of the astronauts brought back uh, what, what became known by the press as the Genesis rock. This is, this is what the rock that everybody thought at the time was one of those rocks that went all the way back to the actual formation of the solar system. After analysis, it turns out, not quite. It's, it's about a million years uh, uh, short of being the, but it is the oldest rock we've ever found. Apollo 16, this, this oh, back, back to 15, there's one other story I wanted to tell you. Remember I keep on talking about uh, stuff happening on all these missions that could have uh, screwed it up. They had two problems on this one. This one, uh, they, when they were landing, they actually were actively changing, they were putting in patches into the computer in order to correct for the uh, memory overflow problem that kept on playing. So they were actually, as they were going down, putting in patches and, and trying to get the computer to work properly. The second thing on this, this mission is, as they were coming in for a landing, they popped the chutes. Not all three chutes opened. One chute actually got burned off. There was leftover fuel in the, in the reactive uh, jets. And uh, in a, what NASA says, a 1 in 17,000 chance, it actually burned through the, the cables of the, of, the, of the parachute. So the, the Apollo 15 came down a little faster than they wanted to go. And, uh, and they, they obviously, instead of a nice gentle 19 miles an hour, they landed at 23 miles an hour. There were findings that they ended up in what they called stable two position. Stable one is when you land and you're upright and you're looking at the ceiling and you're looking at the sky. Stable two is when you land the other way <laughs> and you're looking down and, oh, look, there's a shark. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Yeah, they had a bit of an adventure on that one. So we go to Apollo 16. Apollo 16 was considered by many NASA officials as the perfect mission. It was flawless. Until after they landed on the side of that story. So they landed in the Descartes region. But if you, you see, uh, it's just south of the, or down from, from the Sea of Tranquility. And here we uh, see where the, the rover was parked, where the lab is, 
and you can see footprints around, and uh, they set up the geophone line to, for, for their seismometers. Uh, I got a kick out of uh, when I saw the movie The Martian, and they talked about the, uh, uh, the, after the Mark Watley having to dig up an RTG to keep himself warm in this, in this room, Mars rover, and they were using RTGs on this mission. So the, there was an RTG on this one. For those who don't know what an RTG is, radioact it's, a, it's radioactive, it's uh, used to decay decaying plutonium. So. And here we go with a picture of <coughs> Lem and the uh, rover. Oh, by the way, that rover also was listed on eBay. Um, here's uh, Charlie Duke taking a core sample. Now, uh, on, on, on 16, like I said, every, it was the perfect mission. They landed, everything was safe. They, got, they took the, uh, the command uh, capsule back to uh, being refurbed. They put it into, into the building. And uh, there was still some re leftover reactor fuel in that, and it blew up, and it blew the windows out of the building, injured a few, uh, quite a few people. Nobody died. And uh, and uh, if you go to, I think it's, I think this one's at in Houston. If you go and see it, you'll see it, there's a there's a scratch on the side of the of the capsule. That's actually from from a toolbox that in the, in the refurbishment place that when it blew up, kind of bounced around and hit the, hit the capsule. 17, our last mission, the last one in which a human being actually stepped foot on, on the moon. Um, the only mission that actually had a real scientist that was uh, Harrison. We brought back the most uh, amount of uh, lunar samples. Uh, landed the Taurus Litro, which is right there. Here's the LRO picture of the landing site. The most significant thing was as they were walking uh, going about tech collecting samples, uh, Harrison spotted some orange soil. Doesn't look that orange in the picture, but he called it orange soil. It turned out to be exactly what he was looking for. Actual uh, uh, lava uh, 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 eruption uh, soil from from a volcanic eruption. And they had been looking, searching for this stuff all over the moon. Uh, most of what they had been finding was just regular basalt. And uh, they actually found uh, uh, these granules that uh, indicated uh, actual volcanic activity. Now, uh, so, so Apollo uh, 17 was the last time we, anybody, else, any human has set foot on uh, on the moon. But prior to, um, to Apollo, the United States, NASA sent uh, several, had two programs for, for going to the moon to get data. First one was Ranger. I mean, you talk about a program that people have forgotten about. Ranger is it. Ranger, uh, the concept was, was to put a bunch of cameras into a probe, send it, uh, at the moon and take a lot of pictures just before it crashes. And, uh, and uh, the first uh, few missions, uh, they either had a uh, 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 an engineering malfunction or they missed the moon. But there was, there was like three, three attempts where they completely missed the moon. And it became a big controversy. Uh, uh, there was actually uh, congressional hearings about why can't NASA hit the moon? We can see it. <laughs> but, but, but by the time they got to 7, 8, 9, they, they, they got the science down. They simplified the, 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 the Ranger uh, probe and they got their math right and they, they hit the moon. And so you see a little uh, sample of, uh, of the type of pictures. I mean, things just creamy into the moon. It was funny when I was writing the book, I, 
I kept on talking about impact on the moon, impact on the moon. You know, as a reader, I, I kept on saying to myself, you know, this gets boring, you know, to send this thing to impact on the moon. Middle of the night, and this is a true story, two o'clock in the morning, I get up in the middle of the night, and the word kamikaze dive came to, to my mind. And I immediately ran down to, the, to my computer and used that term. So those of you who've got my books, uh, get, uh, look for that kamikaze uh, terminology. Uh, after, after the Ranger series, we had the, uh, the <coughs> Surveyor series, which were actual soft landings on the moon, in which they would uh, go and, and take samples and get a sense of, because there was, there was uh, at a time that nobody really knew if you could actually walk on the moon. It, there was some scientists who thought it was so dusty there that if you landed there, it would just disappear into, into the dust. Um, so, Fortunately, Surveyor proved that, oh, maybe you know, this is fairly solid. We can land something there. And then uh, I conclude in the book about, you know, what's our future? Uh, to, to us, the great adventure was going to the moon. For our children and our children's children, going to Mars is, is that goal. And so, uh, and, and just getting back to the moon, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of countries that are interested in going back there. Um, even NASA has had plans, and depending on which politician you want to talk to, either that is going to happen or it's not going to happen. Going to Mars is, is going to be a challenge. And for the, uh, now, what I'm showing here is what's reflected in my book, not what's been reflected by Elon Musk in the last couple of days. Um, but there are some challenges. What kind of um, engine are being used to get there? Uh, there's a lot of talk of, of different type of ion drives, of which these are two. Uh, consumables are a real problem. And, uh, and the, the human factors, uh, a really interesting, you know, a long extended uh, trip to, to Mars. Uh, the human body doesn't like to be weightless. It, it, it divests itself of calcium very, very rapidly. And, uh, and that's why you see these guys coming back from, uh, from the ISS and they have to be carried around because they, they, their, their, bodies, their bones can't support their bodies any longer. And it takes a while for them to eat enough steak and whatever to get the calcium back. So we have a lot of challenges to go going back into space and uh, yeah, there's new technologies. Uh, need to find a way to afford all this. this, is, this the, these kind of missions are not cheap. Uh, but uh, I, I, as I often tell people at, at uh, outreach programs, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're spending an awful lot of money. And what they don't realize is if you want real job creation, the space program is it. Because not only are you hiring scientists and engineers to build these, you have to find the technicians to build these things. And, you know, and those people need laborers to build, to build that. And then those people need people cleaning the bathrooms, so you need janitors. And it just, it just opens up. And, 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 uh, and as we have found out since uh, since uh, our, the 60s and the big space race then, is that this could really drive our country's economy. Because if it weren't for NASA, if it weren't for going to, uh, to Apollo, but going to the moon, this probably wouldn't have happened. Because you have an entire industry of, of electronics that developed from that. And you've got GPS in this, and GPS doesn't happen. People, you know, do you realize how many people don't realize that GPS stands for Global Positioning System, and it's actually satellites up there? I, I, I encountered somebody out, out in Winchester who didn't even know that there was, there's 24 satellites plus four spares up there that does the GPS. That's sad. <laughs> Hence the need for a higher education. <laughs> so, so that's my book. I have one copy left here. You can find it on Amazon. 
Uh, it's my first book, and as my editor told me at um, at Neat this past Neat, but uh, it's one of the best-selling titles under uh, under the Patrick Moore uh, Practical Astronomy series, which I was absolutely flabbergasted. Unfortunately, I am not getting any royalties on that book. I followed Tom Clancy's lead. Tom Clancy on his uh, on Hunt for Red October took a five thousand dollar check to have it published. So he didn't make any money on on, on movie rights on that one, but everything else he made a ton of money. Uh, I got paid a flat fee on this one, but I still would like you to buy it. <laughs> and here's my shameless plug for my other books too. Uh, I have the uh, Hubble Space Telescope Objects book and the Vixen Star book. The Hubble is, I wrote also as a response to um, outreach programs. Because the Hubble book, uh, I realized talking with a lot of a, a lot of kids, and teenagers, they've seen the Hubble pictures, but they don't relate it relate them to actual things you can actually see through a telescope. Uh, they see a picture of like the one on the cover there is is uh, is uh, uh, Pillars of Creation, and they don't realize that's that's actually in uh, M16, Steve Nebula, and so so I wrote that book to cover that. Uh, the next two, the the next book was uh, on the Vix and Sphinx mounts. Um, it turns out at, at hands-on optics, I was the expert on how to use that that telescope uh, and the and the uh, computer controller. And they have two versions, and I cover both uh, both the versions of the controller. Uh, this book is not selling that well in the United States, but boy, am I big in Japan. 90% of these mounts are sold in Japan, and, and they're not even bothering to translate it. And they're, they're, um, unfortunately, I didn't take the uh, royalty on that either. <laughs> <laughs> these three books, I took flat fees. This is the first book that I actually took uh, uh, royalties on. It's coming out this week. I just got notice Friday from Springer. It, they're sending me my copies this week. So I'm really excited about it. It's, it's covering the Celestron Evolution series of telescopes, which uses Wi-Fi and an app on your iPad or, or iPhone to control it. So you don't have wires all over the place. It has built-in uh, battery pack in it. So you don't have to have a battery pack. It is, they sent me one of these telescopes. I had so much fun with it. I couldn't use any of my other telescopes for six months. You know, with all the new rocket programs that they have, uh, there was some, uh, uh, the engineers actually had to go back to the Saturn V to figure out how some of the things were done. They couldn't remember because we had not one generation, not two, we're three generations away from, from Apollo. And uh, the corporate knowledge didn't exist anymore. So they had to go back to, to uh, the Saturn V to figure out, well, you know, they have the, if they have the fuel tank like this, and you have the liquid oxygen tank like this, and, and they, they fit together, you know, how do they insulate that? 